Well, welcome everybody to our uh, live webinar. My name is Jesse Gutnick and um, the rest of our panels listed up here, we've got uh, Jamie Sarver who both works in our department and is a patient. So she is gonna be sharing both perspectives um, there. And then also Karen Schultz, who is um, the coordinator for our department, but also one of our obesity medicine providers. Um, I wanna take you through a, a brief agenda of what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna start off with Jamie's um, personal story. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the science behind the effectiveness and safety of weight loss surgery. We're gonna go through what to expect in our program, and then we'll go into a Q&A session. Um, throughout this, please submit any questions you have via the chat to all panelists um, and submit whenever you think of it. And we're gonna have a Q&A session after the presentation um, today. And with that, I'm gonna hand things over to Jamie. Please take it away. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Jamie Sarver. I am one of the um, nurses that works in our department as well as a program coordinator. Um, and I've also been a patient for about the last five years. Um, pretty much as soon as I started in our department and kind of found out about, um, you know, why I was having such struggles with my weight loss, um, things like that, and what I could do to kind of correct those issues. Um, so I'm excited to just kind of share my journey with you and just kind of help you maybe try to figure out more of what um, bariatric surgery uh, entails and um, how it worked for me. So next slide, please. Are you able to change to the next slide, Dr. Gutnick? Uh, let's see, I am on the next slide on my computer. Okay, it's not showing me the, um, you're still in, um, not in presenter mode. So I don't know if that helps. Hmm. It's still showing the first slide. Totally different from how mine looks. Yeah. Sorry about this. Uh... Yeah, it's on slide one. Okay, now you're not sharing at all. Yep, I'm gonna try resharing. Okay. Sorry about that. Sorry, technical difficulties. <laughs> so while you're doing that, I might as well just get started talking. Okay, it's starting. Yay. Okay. Yay. There we go. Okay, so you can see from these pictures here, um, these are my um, pictures over the last few years um, after surgery. Um, uh, so the first, the one on the left is um, the very first year after surgery. I had surgery in um, uh, December of 2019. And you can see in September of 2020, I look uh, pretty different. My highest weight uh, before surgery was, um, 253 pounds and so about here I was um, I think I was pretty close to like 170 180 um, the middle picture another year later um, I had gotten my weight down a little bit more I was down in like the 160s 150s um, and then this picture on the very right is from September of 2023 um, that is actually my surgeon, Dr. John Rodriguez. He actually currently works at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. Um, so unfortunately, he's not available to do surgeries here, but he's, it's so great to see him every once in a while. Next slide. So a little information to the case, uh, my specific um, situation. Prior to bariatric surgery, um, I was 34 at the time. I was actually like ready to start having surgery. My highest weight was 253 pounds. I really didn't have any comorbid conditions or any significant diagnoses that were weight related. So I didn't have diabetes or hypertension or anything like that, but I had a family history of these problems. Um, specifically on my mom's side, she has a history of diabetes. Her mom has a history of diabetes. So there's always been issues that I knew were, you know, if I didn't do something to correct um, my weight, um, earlier on, then I was going to eventually wind up having some issues. I had for years done diet and lifestyle interventions. 
Um, however, they were um, ineffective at maintaining that weight loss. So I would be able to lose weight, um, not you know a significant amount, but I would lose some weight, feel optimistic, and then you know I would start gaining weight again. So um, as I mentioned, I had had bariatric surgery on December 13th, 2019. I had the gastric bypass. Um, right before surgery, I was 233 pounds. I started losing a little bit of weight prior to bariatric surgery. Um, and my current weight fluctuates between 125 and 130 ish pounds. Um, and so I've had about a 128 pounds total weight loss, which is amazing. <laughs> I could not have asked for that. Um, my time in surgery was about an hour and 20 minutes and I was in the hospital for a day and a half. Um, I really only needed about three days of recovery of taking like Tylenol and like actual pain medications where it was like, hey, you need to kind of stay on top of your pain meds. But after that, I was actually fine. And it's a little different than musculoskeletal pain. Um, it only kind of hurts when you're like moving a little bit um, and you just feel a little tenderness, tightness in your stomach. Um, like you got a really intense ab workout, but um, nothing too significant that stopped me from being able to get up, walk around, um, do stairs, that kind of stuff. I was actually back to work in about four weeks um, and uh, went right back to work with no issues. But there are some people that can go back to work sooner. That is a discussion that you have with your surgeon and it's also based on what your um, actual work entails. Next slide. So I like to show this slide. It just shows a little bit about my actual weight loss um, uh, graph. So you can kind of see um, prior to surgery, everything that's on the left side of that arrow, um, that was where my weight was kind of hovering at that 250 pound mark. Um, I had done a few things like medications to try to work on weight loss prior to actual bariatric surgery. Um, however, they were, you know, they worked for a little bit, but then were ineffective. I wound up having surgery and you can see that really significant quick drop um, between surgery and that six months post-op. That's pretty common for you to lose a rapid amount of weight loss within that first six months. And then you kind of start to plateau over a, over the next you know year and a half, two years. Um, so that's where you can kind of see that. And then I also kind of worked to increase, um, make some additional changes to lose some additional weight thereafter. Next slide. So some post-op milestones, I just like to talk to people about um, just kind of like some expectations that they can kind of, you know, plan to have um, immediately post-op and within that first year. Um, at two to four weeks post-op, um, usually you are not supposed to be on, um, you're really on like a soft diet, you're on mostly liquid diet, a lot of protein shakes are your main source of nutrition. Um, and so, I, it, it can be difficult just because you get really sick of the protein shakes. Um, it's just um, a boring diet all over, all around. Um, and um, so that can be a little bit difficult. And really, you're just kind of focusing on making sure that you're getting adequate nutrition. That is your primary goal is making sure that you don't get malnourished, essentially. So getting your water and getting your protein goals are like your top priorities within those first four weeks. Then you want to also start, you know, making sure that you're getting moving, start developing your healthy habits and things like that while you're off of work. Um, that's always what I tell people is going to be best for you. Um, surgical pain. By the time I was two months post-op, I was totally, or two weeks post-op, I was totally fine. I wasn't really having any issues after that. Um, at one to three months post-op, I was actually hitting all of my protein goals and my water goals daily. Um, but I, um, I, there would be some days where I would just kind of, I still wasn't fully in that habit of like, you need to make sure you're doing this every single day. I knew when I wasn't getting what I was supposed to be doing. Um, the weight loss at this point is extremely noticeable to you. And it's also noticeable to others, um, just even like from day to day. So walking into work the one day and then the very next day you see people and they're like, I literally just saw you yesterday and you, look completely different your face looks different um stuff like that another thing that's really important to notice is your activity level is already changing by the time you're at one month post up um that was something that was significant to me um i like i said went back to work right at four weeks post up and um i 
worked a floor as a floor nurse in an ambulatory setting for eight hours a day and was pretty much on my feet running up and down the hall. Um, and I would have never even considered wearing anything other than tennis shoes prior to. Um, and I, I mean, I could tell immediately that I, my feet weren't, I wasn't coming home. My feet weren't hurting. I wasn't having to take, you know, Tylenol or ibuprofen to kind of help with the, like, um, you know, joint pain or anything like that, that I would get. Um, and so immediately I could tell that. And then in addition to that, even just going up and down stairs and just, you know, the breathing, the heavy breathing, that kind of stuff immediately I just noticed I was able to like do a lot more without having to worry about um, whether or not it was going to wind me. Um, at three to six months post-op, this is when I like to say that food is finally your friend again. Um, a lot of that internal swelling that you have around your stomach um, tends to start to go down after about 12 weeks. Um, and so you're finally able to kind of eat some more foods or varied foods. And then on top of that, your um, ability, like certain other foods that you're supposed to be kind of restricted on, like lettuces and you know vegetables, that kind of stuff, you start to be able to eat that more. And so you're finally actually able to eat and enjoy food again for actually enjoying it. Um, so that's you know helpful at that time. Um, you're still losing weight at a really good pace during this time. Um, so you'll notice that you're, uh, you know, people, your friends, your family, they're all going to be like, wow, oh my gosh, like every time I see you, it's something completely, you look completely different. Um, I normally tell people don't go on any kind of extravagant um, clothing, shopping trips or anything like that during this time, because you'll wear something one time and it doesn't fit you, it's too big on you the very next time you wear it. So um, your weight loss is rapid during that time. Uh, again, the activity level, it's still improving even more so than it was at that in, um, you know, first one to three months, you're um, really able to do a lot more in those three to six months. Um, I think I put in like a fence in my garden, uh, dug fence post holes and all that kind of stuff um, during that summer. So uh, definitely improves your um, activity during that time. Um, at six to 12 months, this is kind of when you start to kind of stabilize. stabilize. Um, you've had that significant amount of weight loss. Um, like I said, it starts kind of slowing down, but you're still losing some weight. You're reaching your protein and water go goals on a daily basis. Um, the one thing that I noticed that was a big difference, and I really started noticing it more significantly during this time, was I was having like minimal cravings for things. So in the past, I would kind of think about food or I'd be like, you know, oh, there's, you know, we have treats in the cupboard or something like that. Um, for the first time in my life, I really never, I, I didn't have that. Um, it was actually my son's birthday in June. So about six months after I had surgery. And that was the first time in like his entire life that we threw away like half of a cake because it just went bad because um, none of us really even wanted it. So um, that was something that was really noticeable. Another thing is like your anatomical changes. By this point, you start noticing like well, if you ate something you maybe shouldn't have or um, your bowel changes and things like that, you start getting a little more comfortable with that. Um, you kind of know what's what to expect. Um, by that point. And then your intimacy and your relationships with partners or significant others and even family and friends, um, you know, it's slightly different. Um, my husband knew I was having bariatric surgery. He was supportive. He didn't feel that I needed it, but he was very supportive knowing that I felt like I needed it and for my health, my own health. Um, and um, it was funny because after I had the surgery, um, he would, you know, be like, oh my gosh, you look, you know, your confidence is improved, you know, all of these types of things. And so we would be out in public and he'd be like, look at Jamie, doesn't she look great? You know, um, things like that, where it was like, he was kind of impressed and he even started noticing the changes in our diets. And that really actually helped him to kind of change his diet as well. Um, and then I just kind of like to mention those non-measurable goals that are noticeable to people as well, um, or to yourself. Um, I say um, putting on a sock while standing, that was one of the first things I really, really noticed um, where I was actually like, I my balance was like suddenly improved where I was able to just be able to slip a sock on or paint my toenails or things like that, where it's not something like that you can measure on a scale, but it's something that you didn't really realize affected you and your life until 
um, that actually, <laughs> until you realize that you were not able to do it and now you can. Um, so those are some of the post-op milestones that I just like to kind of mention to people. Next slides. Okay, so now that I'm um, about four years post-op, I like to just quickly go over some of like, how am I maintaining this weight? So I look at this as an investment that I made in myself um, to make you know me feel better about myself, but also give me a lot better health and a better outcome on being able to just manage obesity. And so what am I doing to protect that investment is something that I always try to talk to people about. Um, so still to this day, I am mindful of how much sugar is in everything that I put in my mouth. So even if I'm going to have candy, even if I'm going to have something sweet, I can have that. Um, however, you just have to be mindful of that. So for the gastric bypass, my dietitian told me anything more than 10 to 11 grams of sugar can cause me to have some dumping syndrome or get, make me feel sick. So I'm very careful about how much sugar I get in. I also make sure that I'm getting my protein and water in on a regular basis. So um, I know if I haven't gotten those and I start feeling tired or weak or things like that, I, I think like, did I take in my protein what I'm supposed to take in? And to this day, I still wind up having to either take a protein shake at least once a day, or I eat a protein bar or something that's got a high amount of protein in it, just so that I can kind of catch that protein goal. Um, exercise. Weight resistance training um, to me has made such a significant impact, um, more so than even cardio. Um, and I am one of those people that is 100% guilty of my doctor said, you know, get exercising as soon as you can. And I was like, yeah, 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 great. And then I started losing all kinds of weight. And I was like, I don't need to exercise. I'm losing all this weight. And then once I started plateauing and I was like, how come I'm not losing anymore? I started really looking at why am I not losing the weight that I should be losing or why am I slowing down so much and exercise specifically that weight resistance training was um, one of the things that I just really wasn't doing. And um, I have another slide that's gonna show you why it's so important. And I talk about this all the time and just try to tell people that that is one of the best things that you can do to really help with the um, extra skin and help to increase your weight loss, um, all of that kind of stuff and just really help you tone. Um, so exercise is really important. Um, also daily vitamin uh, intake. I was taking vitamins beforehand. Um, I take vitamins still. Um, so there are specially formulated vitamins for people after they've had bariatric surgery. Um, there's multiple different brands um, I usually just have like a little coffee mug or cup thing um, at my desk at work and I have a thing at my desk at home and I just, you know, whenever I'm working, I just think, oh, it's time for me to take my vitamin and I just have to take it once a day and I get my vitamins in. So uh, maintaining those vitamins is important. And then the last thing is keeping up with your post-op appointments. Those are crucial. Um, because that's the ability for us to help to make sure that you're staying on track as well as checking any labs, checking any kind of problems that you might have before they come, become a significant issue. Um, and, and specifically, we have patients that will come back or they tell us, you know, I knew somebody that had that and they've gained all their weight back. I take care of those patients or I work with the providers that do take care of those patients. And a lot of times they, 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 they're they're fearful to come back or they haven't come back because they gained so much weight and then they didn't know what to do. Um, and so we always try to get people to come back before you've gained all of your weight back when we might be able to help you get back that 20 pounds or less as opposed to gaining all that weight back. So we try to just make sure everybody knows it's important to continue lifelong follow-up appointments. Next slide. Okay, so this is the slide that we all love. Um, so you can see uh, the summer of 2020, that was actually um, the summer right when I had, right after I had surgery, I was about 165 to 170 pounds at that point, but you can tell I didn't really have any muscle tone. I was starting to kind of plateau on my weight loss. I was definitely happy with like, oh my gosh, I've lost so much weight, but I knew that I could probably do better. And so um, during that fall, I started exercising. Um, I do not have a home or I do not have like a gym membership or anything like that. This is literally, I had a rowing machine before I even started, before I even had surgery and I had free weights. And that was the picture on the right is me just from doing 
regular consistent exercising you know three days a week even sometimes two days a week depending on you know how busy the week was but really mostly that weight resistance training um and so i was able to lose weight but i was also able to really significantly tone and that was one of the first times in my life where actually seeing exercise was actually helping me um i used to go to the gym before and like nothing i it, i would go for months and i wouldn't have noticed any changes and so being able to see that really really did um, play an important effect on um, how I kind of talk to people about bariatric surgery now. So I think that's a really important slide. I believe that's it for my slides. So thank you everybody for joining us and um, I will be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much. I'm okay. gonna talk a little bit about the science behind the surgeries um, and briefly how they work. So throughout our hormonal balance in our body, we have almost like a thermostat for our weight and our weight tries to stay the same um, based on that hormonal balance so that's why it's hard to lose weight because when you diet you your body fights the weight loss um, weight loss surgery reprograms your body to manage the calories that you're taking in differently and you also take in fewer calories generally speaking based on the smaller stomach um, and really what happens to kind of compare them is when you're dieting your, your basal energy expenditure or the amount of energy you, you use just to go through your daily life. You're not doing anything particular. Like right now when I'm sitting, not exercising, when you're dieting, that amount of energy goes down to conserve energy. Um, after, after bariatric surgery, that increases. Similarly, appetite, satiety, and stress responses are all the opposite. Um, when you're dieting, it actually increases your stress hormones. After surgery, those decrease. And then a whole bunch of other um, gut hormones uh, start changing. And these both work in your intestines, but they also are send signals out to the rest of the body and to your brain on how to manage the food and, and how hungry or, or satiated are you. The um, options for weight loss surgery that cur you know, currently are sleeve gastrectomy, gastric bypass, and less commonly the duodenal switch or SADI procedure and revisional surgery. I'm going to show you um, the, some scientific information uh, that's basically mostly based on gastric bypass and sleep gastrectomy because these comprise about 90% of the weight loss operations. So this is where more of these sort of uh, high-level research studies have been done. Um, the most famous one for us, certainly, but what really one that put bariatric surgery on the map in terms of what it can do for your health is called the Stampede Trial. It was conducted here. And it looked at not just patients that underwent weight loss surgery, but it was a randomized controlled trial of patients with diabetes who underwent weight loss surgery because it really wanted to study very carefully how these affected the diabetes and not just the weight loss. So, of course, they also measured weight loss. And to just sort of give you a sense of how this graph works, on the red, sorry, in the yellow line is the people that underwent um, medical treatment for their diabetes. And you can see that they did lose weight over time. Um, and then comparing it to the gastric bypass and the sleeve gastrectomy, they lost significantly more weight over that time, around um, 10 BMI points. Similarly, along with that weight loss, the A1C, which is a measurement of how in control or out of control your diabetes is, um, there was a really nice improvement on the medical weight loss, almost two points, which is actually excellent for the hemoglobin A1C, but it was significantly more with the um, weight loss surgeries, as you can see below. And so it doesn't just work on diabetes, but it works on all of the things that are the parts of the body that are affected by obesity. So um, commonly sleep apnea, joint problems, um, high blood pressure, arthritis are some of the most common ones. In terms of the safety of surgery, um, the way that I think about safety is comparing weight loss surgery to what you would do otherwise. And there's really two components. The first and the one that pe most people think about is the risk of surgery, which is small. Um, but what people often don't think about when you're comparing safety or thinking about safety is what the health benefit is over time. So safety isn't just something that happens now. It's what is the safety of surgery over the rest of my life? What's it, how's it going to affect my life over a long period? And let's first talk about the safety of surgery. 
So there's a revolution in bariatric surgery um, from about 1990 um, to about 2010, where the risk of surgery went down over tenfold. Um, back in 2002, there was about a risk of um, four out of a thousand for risk of death in the hospital of about four out of a thousand. And by 2009, it went down to 0 0.6 out of a thousand. And it's continued to drop since then, but that was where the really big drop was. Now it's it's down around 0.8% um, risk, or less than one in a thousand. Um, but the other way that I think about it, and the other component to thinking about safety is um, how it, it kind of puts it in context, like how does this compare to other operations? So to do that, this study compared people that underwent weight loss surgery, actually diabetic people who have a higher risk of complications from any type of surgery. When it went weight loss surgery down at the bottom, gastric bypass, to other common ones that you might think of just to compare them. So a knee replacement, for example, has about a 16% risk of any type of complication if you're diabetic. Um, compare that to a gastric bypass, about 3.4% risk of any type of problem or complication, even very minor ones are counted in this. And that's on the order of getting a gallbladder removal or a hysterectomy, operations which are commonly done, which you might be even familiar with or have experienced. Um, the other thing that we can look at is the health benefits over time. So these are most important, um, or, or one of the things that's most important to many patients is the cardiovascular risk because that can cause death. If you have a heart attack, that can cause death or a stroke. So in this study, they compared 2,000 um, patients who underwent gastric bypass or sleeve gastrectomy and compared this to 11,000 people. All these people had obesity and, and type 2 diabetes. Again, we're looking at this in diabetes because um, diabetes is number one, something easy to measure. Number two, really affects your health poorly. And if you look at this graph, you can see this is the incidence of people developing heart failure, coronary disease, arrhythmia, stroke, kidney disease, or high blood pressure, All any, any or all of those. And you can see in the people that didn't have surgery, the rate that it's going up in the yellow, and the people who underwent weight loss surgery or metabolic surgery down below. And so they're, it's rising, of course, because they are people that had diabetes, but it's rising at a much slower rate, and that continues over time. So not just for diabetes, but by treating sleep apnea, um, by increasing the quality of life, decreasing joint pain, allowing people to exercise more, decreasing risk of cancers, treating fatty liver, um, all these things put together increase the longevity after weight loss surgery. And with that, I'm gonna turn things over to um, Karen for a quick uh, discussion of our program. Okay, thanks Dr. Kutnick. Um, so I am an advanced practice nurse, so I also see uh, patients in our program, and I'm the administrator, enterprise administrator for the Bariatric and Metabolic Institute. And one of the things that is important to me, is I know it's important to all of you, is that we are in your community. So we have done a lot um, as far as regionalizing the program. We still operate at main campus, but also have um, offices on the west side. Um, Fairview Hospital, Avon, and now a brand new office in Westlake um, on the east side, Hillcrest Hospital, with an outpatient center in Twinsburg, um, and uh, soon to be, we're also at Lutheran Hospital and soon to be in Mentor. So we try to be as close to home as possible and also can be in your home because many of our uh, services now can be done via virtual visit if that's something that you're interested in. So for those patients that live a, a good distance from our locations or perhaps have issues with mobility or just super busy, um, we're, we're definitely happy to um, to do some or all of the program visits virtually. Um, we, we do like to see at least one in-person visit, if, if possible. We think that um, you would enjoy meeting us in person. Uh, we haven't figured out how to do surgery virtually just yet, so you will meet your surgeon absolutely for, for sure. Um, but yeah, we try to do, we try to be wherever you are. Next slide, please. And thank you for choosing uh, the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, we do know that we have some um, high national uh, rankings, you can see that here, main campus number one in Ohio, number two in the nation, Fairview and Hillcrest also rated 
uh, very high. So great organization, and that's by US News and World Report. Next slide. Um, the other thing is each, each patient, um, actually each surgeon has a navigator attached to him and each patient has a navigator. When you enter the program then, um, that navigator will check to see if your insurance has coverage for bariatric surgery. Um, they'll make sure that um, if you're having difficulty getting those appointments, that you're organized, that you know your insurance requirements. Um, so there will be someone that you can reach out to. So those, some of those pre-operative insurance required requirements can sometimes be complicated, and we know that. So you will have someone who is knowledgeable who can help you there. Next slide, please. And I want to mention that, you know, Cleveland Clinic has really invested in the bariatric surgery program. We have a large team um, that you will be surrounded by. Um, that includes um, eight bariatric specialized dietitians. We have 10 obesity medicine providers, we have eight psychologists who have specialized in bariatric surgery, probably the biggest in the in the country. I can't, I've never met a program with as many specialized psychologists as what we have at the Cleveland Clinic. We have 12 bariatric surgeons and uh, a variety of consultants. Um, in addition, each surgeon has a nurse care coordinator who will work very closely with you. Um, once your navigator gets the approval for surgery, your case will be handed off to the surgeon's nurse who will work with you to select a date and make sure you are fully educated about uh, next steps in the program. So you won't interact with all of these people, but each of you will have a team that consists of the dietitian, obesity medicine, psychologist, surgeon, navigator, and care coordinator. So you will be well taken care of. Next slide. Okay, we are here already. Um, so we're gonna do question and answers. Um, those of you who haven't yet, um, you can put a question into the chat and our panelists will come back on and be happy to um, answer anything. So, um, so far, Let's see, don't see, I see one question in the chat and I started answering it to one person, but I think it bears um, saying out loud because I think a lot of people um, wonder about some of those new injections um, for weight management. Um, and so right now what we're seeing is um, they can be helpful for some patients, but they're very expensive and they're not covered by most insurance company companies. We don't have long term data on people in our unique category of weight, which is BMI 35 and above. But I know Dr. Gutnick has seen this as I've seen in my practice that most of those drugs will work for a while, but they won't get patients to where they really want to be to that healthy weight that they want to be on average. So, you know, we are keeping our eye um, on the injectable medications for obesity, but we don't feel right now that they are the, the answer for the majority of people. Do you want to comment on that, Dr. Gutnick? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a many hour conversation, but my I've got two brief points that I would make. Um, in terms of how effective they are for a particular person getting to their goal depends on where they're starting. And so many of the patients that seek me out, um, uh, you know, their weight, what they would like from the weight loss is significantly more than they would get the, with the drugs. There's many people that I don't see that maybe have less weight that they would like to lose that, that could be very effectively treated by them if they can afford to do it. Um, the other thing is that um, the, more than 50% of the people that I see um, have have tried those medications and have, you know, decided to do surgery afterwards for one of four reasons, which is really the four reasons anybody decides to stop a drug. One, they they it was effective, but not didn't get them where they want to go. Um, so it was the expected amount of effectiveness. Two, they're the person, and there's this for any drug or medication that it, it just didn't work on. Um, three, they had intolerable side effects. Um, or four, um, they did it, they liked it, but then they couldn't afford it and stopped it and then 
regained weight. So those are really the four reasons why, and, and probably more than 50% of the people that I see um, have tried one of these new medications already. Um, the other point that I'll make is that our, our bariatric medicine um, people do um, also prescribe these medications. And so um, we have people that are kind of in the program and working with on the medication because they're not sure if they want surgery. Um, that's less common. Um, and then there's people where we've used it in combination, which there's no, to my knowledge, there's no scientific information um, about that, but in selective cases that that can be effective. Um, but, but, so that's my opinion on them. I think they're another good tool um, to help treat obesity. And it's a very exciting time. Okay, Dr. Gunda, I know you had to sign out to, to go to a meeting, so I'm going to give you one more question. Um, what percent of people gain the weight back? So it depends on the weight loss operation that's selected. And I'm going to give very round numbers because um, this hasn't been studied in as rigorous of a way as we would like, but this is my just thought from looking through all the research. So for, uh, and, and I'm talking about like at 10 years, not, not at one year or whatever, but at 10 years, so over a long period of time, it seems to be approximately, for sleeve gastrectomy, approximately one in six, for gastric bypass, approximately one in seven to eight, and for duodenal switch, approximately one in nine to 10 will regain significant weight. Okay. And I, and I will just add to that because I've seen, you know, some people in that situation and a little bit of it depends on how connected they stay with the program. So um, people that are having difficult with weight regain, oftentimes we can get them back on track if they come to the program. If they, you know, our, the program is not just for surgery, it is a lifetime of follow-up. So we do have uh, classes um, nutritional programs for people that are struggling a little bit. So hopefully they won't be in that one to six, one to seven and an eight category. Yeah. The other thing I'll, I'll mention, um, sort of as a last point, and I think Jamie's right, that picture that, that before and after exercise picture with the same weight really hammers on the point, you know, visually. But one thing that we know from every study that's ever been done on weight, on maintenance of weight loss, whether it's people that have used surgery to lose weight, where the people um, did it without any medication or surgery, just with a, a very strict diet, or people that um, did it with weight loss medications. The number one thing for weight maintenance is some type of um, frequent exercise. So at least every few days, if not daily, some type of exercise was the most important thing across all these studies in terms of maintaining weight loss over the very long term. And these are studies that have gone over, over the long term. And so, um, adding something like that really helps to solidify those gains over time. I guess losses, you should say, but the, the health gains. Yeah, absolutely. It is a tool like any other tool in the toolbox and you need to be adding other things to that equation as well. But having said that, the majority of people given the health of surgery can lose weight and keep it off for a lifetime just it, when everything else has failed. So with that, and I apologize to the people on here, we also have a, a national scientific meeting that I'm taking some time out from to do this webinar, but I, I do need to go to return to that. Bye, thank you, Dr. Gutnick. Thank, thank you, Dr. Both. Gutnick. And thank yeah. you everybody for signing on today. Yeah, but Jamie and I will get to the rest of the questions here. So um, I'll head this one to Jamie. What, um, like how long before we can get the surgery? That's a really common question. Yeah, so um, it just really depends on your insurance. Um, so I am on the administrative side of things now. So um, each person's insurance is gonna have a different um, requirement on um, what uh, you know you need to meet in terms of their requirements. Um, so some insurances, they say that they want you to meet with a dietitian or have medically supervised weight loss for um, a few months, sometimes that can be three months, sometimes that can be six months, sometimes they don't really care about a number of months, they just want you to have a certain number of visits, um, that kind of thing. So what we try to do in our department is just get those patients um, during those visits that they're required, whether it's three months or six months or whatever that case may be, whatever your insurance requires, 
we also during that time are trying to get you through what our program needs are. So I try to always make sure when I'm telling patients that, um, you know, just because your insurance has things that they need you to do, um, we as medical professionals that are, you know, licensed and trying to make sure that you are safe for surgery also have a standard that we have to meet to make sure that you're safe and ready to go for surgery and that you're going to be prepared and you're going to be successful after surgery. Um, and so there are some criteria um, and things that we want you to do, just making sure that you're safe and ready to go, specifically, you know, getting checked out by one of our OBC medicine physicians to make sure that your, you know, heart's okay or, you know, that you're maybe you're on blood thinners or things like that maybe you have problems but you just need to get them kind of stabilized a little bit before you actually start actually having surgery just so that we don't have any problems post-operatively all right thanks jamie sure. um someone's asking about what percent of cases are done in the age 60 plus population um, the average age of someone in the program, I, I know the answer to that, is around 40, but we have people all the way from in their teens at the at main campus. We do have an adolescent program um, all the way up to age 80. So there is, you know, age is looked at like any other factor, a medical factor. So yeah. um, if it's, if you're a healthy age 70, there's no reason you can't apply for bariatric surgery. If you're not so healthy, we're going to make sure that you're as healthy as possible. Um, but it really, we don't look at age as a deterrent to, to have surgery. Um, you can improve quality of life by treating your obesity at any age. Um, and our OBC medicine team will do our best to make sure it's as safe. But you know, having said that, we have done bariatric surgery on people who need organ transplantation so that they can lose enough weight to get on the transplant list. So, mm -hmm. And I was just going to tack on. The patients, we actually have patients that we do simultaneous surgeries where we're doing a hernia repair or, um, you know, we're doing a liver transplant or something like that at the same exact time. So um, the complexity, medical complexity is not even an issue sometimes either. It really is just making sure that you're safe and you're prepared and that we know what's going on with you. We don't want any kind of problems in the actual operating room. So we want to know what to expect when we walk in the, those doors and are ready to go for surgery. Okay, so I want to give this one to you, uh, Jamie. Are you on vitamins for the rest of your life? So yeah, I should be, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, as a medical professional, yes, I am on vitamins for the rest of my life. I actually have my vitamins right here next to my desk and I take them every single day. Um, I mean, some days, you know, I forget or some days I'm out and about and I'm busy and I'm just not by my vitamins or something like that. Um, but yeah, you're supposed to take your vitamins on a daily basis for the rest of your life. Um, I mean, people in general take vitamins daily, um, even without surgery. Um, I was taking them without surgery, uh, daily multivitamin. And so to me, that was really no different. Um, and like I had mentioned before, um, in case anybody missed it, there is actually um, uh, uh, vitamins that are specially formated, formulated for patients that have had bariatric surgery. So they have um, higher levels of certain vitamins in them. Um, um, they, you know, come in just a once daily chew um, where it's easy to just kind of tolerate and, and manage just taking that. And so um, to me, that has been <laughs> the least of my issues as far as um, having had surgery. Um, making sure I'm getting like protein shakes and things like that is actually more of like a, I got to actually really think out my protein for the day as opposed to my vitamins. Okay. Someone else was asking if you're struggling with weight regain after surgery, can you take obesity medications? And yes, sometimes that is one of the things our obesity medicine team that does over years. If people want to optimize their weight loss and they're kind of stuck, we have, uh, full access to prescribing those um, medications, but they are not on average required uh, for patients. But if you need them um, and your insurance covers, we can make yeah. them available. And some of them, yeah. depending on the surgeries, like there's that one, um, Planity. Um, so there's one medication that's out there that you just have to be careful with like gastric bypass, things like that, because it's more of like something that stays inside your stomach and it's like, kind of makes your stomach more full kind of thing. So you do have to be, you know, cautious of what medications you start. But 
the providers do talk to you about those types of things and they take all of that in consideration. Okay, there's um, somebody out there that lost 110 pounds uh, since January 2023. Excellent job. Congratulations. Um, but uh, he is at a standstill. And um, yes, if if you still fit the criteria for surgery, you you could have weight loss surgery at this point to keep that weight off and lose more. We have the same thing happening with people who use medication therapy that might lose, you know, a lot of weight, but they're still not at their healthy goal, still have so much to lose. So um, in that case, yeah, as long as you're still fitting the BMI requirements for surgery, which are 35 and above, um, 35 to 39 with one health issue, um, you may be a candidate to have weight loss surgery even after that big weight loss, and it will be a whole lot safer at a lower weight. So excellent job um, to that person that, that yeah, lost all that weight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what are the next steps after the seminar? Um, so yeah, that's that's uh, coming right up. Um, I still have a couple questions, but we'll say after this seminar, um, when we sign out, when you sign out, there should be a link to launch the registration and this and the actually the another video if you um, would like. So it's on our website. If you are still thinking about it, some of you might already in the program, um, but the next you know, step in the process is to register. Um, there's also a nice video that goes into a little bit more in depth than we are today about the actual program and the people that work there, what it's like to be a patient in the program. Okay. Um, let's see, is there ways to get the surgery approved by insurance before the end of a waiting period. Um, yeah, so skipping the, the insurance requirements, I think this question is, um, and generally that is only done if someone has a urgent medical problem that needs attention, um, such as um, someone that needs an organ transplant and there's a six month requirement for nutrition. So we may be able to bypass that, but just for, for weight alone, uh, most insurance companies won't bypass their requirements. Um, okay, let's see what else we have. If someone's been regularly seeing providers before weight loss, uh, do they count toward the completion of insurance requirements? And the answer is yes. Not every insurance company requires that you be on a certain of time medical weight loss program. But if you've already done that and you can get a note from those visits, we can include those. So that's kind of nice. Um, Oh, here's one for Jamie. Um, maybe <laughs> can you choose how much weight you want to lose? Ex example, if you're 340 and you only want to go to 250. Well, I don't think I've ever gotten that before. <laughs> I, yeah, no, I've never gotten that. So I would say that depending on the actual procedure that you choose, um, each of the different procedures, when you discuss them with your surgeon, um, they are going to have. Um, some some differences in terms of your weight loss and your expected weight loss. Um, so, for example, the sleeve gastrectomy, you may not lose as much as much um, weight. Usually, I think we say about forty to sixty percent of your um, total body weight you can lose expect to lose from that. Again, that is not like a set in stone number. With the gastric bypass and some of those other more. Um, uh, those other surgeries that actually make changes to your actual um, small intestines, um, those can cause a little bit more significance of weight loss. So if you're only looking to lose, you know, 100 pounds or something like that, and you, you know, are, you know, trying to get just down to like 240 pounds, then that's going to definitely be something that you're going to want to talk to the surgeon about as far as like, you know, maybe choosing the sleeve over the gastric bypass or something like that, just because you can have extra weight loss from those um, procedures that, you know, do anatomical changes to your small intestine. Okay, thank you. We have a few questions about the employee health plan. And what I would recommend is that you call Healthy Choice and then specifically ask about the, um, the bariatric surgery program. They have all of that information for you. It's, it's even on their website, but I think it's nicer to talk to somebody. 
um, if you have questions there. Um, there's a few people that have questions about individual health problems that they have, um, like varices in their stomach and all of that. So what I would recommend is um, just if you're interested in surgery, just register, come into the program. There's almost nothing that would make bariatric surgery impossible, but we may have you see the physician that's treating whatever condition that is, we work very closely with them to make sure that you are in the best shape possible. So not that, and it also may vary the procedure that is chosen based on those health issues. Somebody asked, you know, which operation is best? And there's a best operation for each individual person, not a best operation. So you're gonna, you and your surgeon together will make that decision based on your health issues, um, you know, what's going on with your body. There's, there's a lot of, a lot of factors there. Mm -hmm. So, um, Jamie, you could take this 1. I know this is putting the cart before the horse. Um, but do you refer for skin surgery? So we do, um, so usually in most cases, um, we really want you to get to that plateau in your weight before we're going to. Uh, refer you um, to see somebody for um, skin removal surgery. Um, in many, most cases, patients don't really need that um, or their, you know, looser hanging skin is really not like an issue. Um, in terms of insurance coverage, that's another factor that can prohibit people from getting it because it is um, even more so than um, bar bariatric surgery, um, insurances tend to more look at that as like a vanity type thing. Um, and so unless you're actually having um, health conditions that are significantly impacting your daily life, a lot of insurances will not cover um, skin removal surgery. Um, what I normally try to tell people is I, again, I hate to be the dead horse about this, but I always encourage that um, weight resistance training um, because it significantly can really help reduce that amount of hanging and sagging skin. Um, and then just making sure even the vitamins and um, uh, making sure like your protein and your waters and things like that, because um, that really does help your skin and things like that kind of get back to, um, you know, help retain that elasticity and things. So. Um, for me, that's what I noticed. I also know I'm fortunate. I um, am younger, so I had some of that remaining elasticity, and I was pretty lucky that I didn't have to worry too much about that. But those were the things that really helped me. I was, you know, uh, 253 pounds, and to not have, um, I've not needed any kind of, any kind of surgical alterations for sagging or hanging skin or loose skin, and I don't actually have any kind of irritation or any kind of problems from that just because I've been, you know, making sure that I'm exercising, doing that toning, weight resistance, all that kind of stuff. And I, I really do strongly feel like that helps a lot. Okay, a couple of people asking about ESG, and I believe that's the endoscopic sleeve gastrectomy. So this is a different um, seminar. I, I'm not sure the endoluminal program has a seminar, um, but we do do the endoscopic sleeve gastrectomy. So it's the sleeve gastrectomy done through an endoscope. So it's done internally. So this is a, a newer uh, procedure. Um, it's rarely covered by insurance. Um, outcomes are um, still under investigation, but at the Cleveland Clinic, we all are very progressive and we're always looking at the newest techniques. We have a great um, endoscopic uh, bariatric surgeon that's uh, that's part of our program. And um, if you're interested in that, I mean, Jamie, what do you think is the best way to get to the website and just... Um, um, I don't... I actually, they, I would say go to just clevelandclinic.com and just look up, um, you're going to want to look up uh, the uh, endoluminal sleeve, I think, or maybe look up 
the balloon procedure because I think that's done in the same place. Because yeah, but someone had a question place. about balloon too, and um, balloon is never covered by yeah. Um, yeah. insurance. It's about ten thousand um, dollars. It's designed to be a temporary treatment for obesity, so they put the balloon in for. Um, I think the max is six months, and then you have to take it out and take a rest. And if you want it back in, it's more money. Um, so because of that, it's not very popular. I think that's that's yeah. one of the reasons. And um, it's you know it's not designed to be a permanent uh, way to lose weight. But we again at the Cleveland Clinic, we have um, all of those progressive um, procedures available for those of you who are interested. If you look in um, specifically the physician that does those procedures is Dr. Sim Roberto Simmons Linares. Um, there is a recording of this that gets emailed out afterwards, um, but Roberto Simmons Linares um, through our Digestive Disease Institute, he's the person that does those endoscopic procedures um, if that's the route that you wanna go. Yeah, I'll type his name in the chat. Lin High spell Linares, L I N L I N A R E S. Yeah, okay, okay. So you guys can see he's, yeah, he's the person you would look for. Yeah. Um, all right, so just a, a, maybe two more questions here. Um, people that have um, been taking uh, trizepicide, which is Monjaro or Zepbound, worked well. Um, now that it's not in, um, and and they had been in the program before. Um, it makes it, I think it makes it easier if you've been on our program before and you wanna come back because the trisepatide is no longer available and you're gaining weight. Um, but you would need, if it's longer than a year, you would need to touch base um, and, and with each of the main appointments. So the main appointments are with psychology, the surgeon, the dietitian, and obesity medicine, because things do change over time. And we wanna make sure we have that most updated profile about what's going on in your life on in your life right now. Um, but certainly if you've already been through it once, that process should go a little bit more quickly. Okay. And um, revision surgery, someone had a question if, um, you know, the doctor got in fact mentioned that one in nine people or one in eight people who might have gained weight at their after their initial surgery. Um, insurance companies are looking at this like the failure of any surgery. So, for instance, you have a knee replacement, and then 20 years later, that knee needs to be revived. So, occasionally, the same goes for bariatric surgery, and you would come in the program the same way, which is the next step, which is to register again, and uh, we would recheck your insurance, and it will ask you in the questionnaire if you've had bariatric surgery before, and you say yes, and it will take you in a, on down a special pathway, okay, where we would evaluate you uh, a little bit differently because you've had a prior surgery. And we're checking to see if you have coverage for second surgeries. Yes, 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 okay. All right. Well, I think we got to all the questions here. So I wanted to um, thank everyone for your attendance today. And uh, certainly if you think of anything after the seminar, um, you can reach out um, either by calling the center. So we do have a main line. Um, uh, that's the 216-445-2224 or signing on to the registration for the seminar and someone will reach out to you once you have registered for the program. And then I, I did notice somebody had a question about if they're, they just want to talk to somebody before they're, if they're unsure or you want to talk with somebody beforehand, even if you register for the seminar and you say you're unsure or things like that, this is no obligation appointments. Um, you're able to get that first appointment with, you know, one of our obesity medicine, medicine physicians or something like that, um, just to help get you questions answered. Um, and that way you can kind of feel more confident and then kind of decide whether or not you want to move through in the program um, that way as well. But you're more than welcome to call our department and just, you know, get an appointment with however whomever, um, and we can kind of help give you that professional recommendation. Yeah, and I think that's a good point that we do have comprehensive options. So if you wanted to start with our obesity medicine team with medical therapy, we could certainly do that. Um, so thanks again for everyone's attendance and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye.